Hi, everyone. Um, well, first, thanks to Luda and her colleagues for organizing this event. It's, uh, it's been excellent and just wonderful to come together at this moment in time. Um, and also thanks to the students from MA Fashion Studies and MFA Fashion Design Society at Parsons who took my Fashion Cultures course this spring and on the basis of that have made presentations. But I was going to say to Luda, no thanks that I've got to follow Teresa because that was a terribly hard act to follow and I'm not talking about humour. But actually, maybe there is a link uh, there just with Teresa's point about masculine energy, which is not what I'm talking about. But just keep that in mind. Anyway, to begin. So as fashion retail sales decrease in the US, brick and mortar stores have closed and some long standing department stores have declared bankruptcy all in the wake of the pandemic, we might be forgiven for wondering, is this the end of fashion as we knew it? I argue here rather that we could be witnessing a new and more inclusive beginning for the, fashion, for the fashion system, based on the way that some fashion professionals have responded to the pandemic by developing collective consciousness. So in this um, presentation, I want to share um, two responses to COVID-19, which I see as indicating the potential for a more responsible, caring role for fashion going forward based on human need rather than just want the want and desire of new products and um, responses in which women are taking a leadership role. And I'm going to look at them um, briefly in turn. So the first, Fashion Girls for Humanity, is a charitable 5013C nonprofit organization that was founded in 2011 in the wake of the Japanese earthquake and tsunami. Its mission is to bring, as you can see here, humanitarian services and funds to communities in need through its global network of fashion and design industry professionals. Its founders were four women based in New York, but with strong links to Japan and also with very um, deep roots professionally in different aspects of the fashion industry. In the current crisis, Fashion Girls for Humanity responded at the local level, as it had done in Japan, where it raised funds, but this time by addressing the severe shortage of PPE in the US, and particularly at that moment in March in New York, which was um, the epicenter of the crisis. In less than three months, the local initiative became global, and more than 100,000 people, as you can see here, from 155 countries, downloaded mask and gown patterns and viewed how-to tutorials. Um, I just want to, as an aside, go back to Hannah's presentation about scrubs being produced in the UK to make the point that these gown patterns were um, proprietary. So they were not, uh, the gowns were not available and they weren't even made at that point um, in the United States. So one of the women involved in, in the project uh, Mika actually had to get hold of a gown, which she described as re-engineering, taking it apart to put the pattern together. So um, the, the work involved was more complex um, than uh, one might assume. Um, and not only did the website develop for people to make their own gowns, um, but the, the group also raised funds to produce gowns, to have gowns produced by women in New York City's garment district, thus also supporting and developing small businesses during the pandemic and definitely businesses um, which benefited women. My second example is a different one. It's of um, a fashion clothing based company, women, ba women based company, also located in New York State, which has taken a different strategy to developing collective consciousness during the um, pandemic. Eileen Fisher is an eponymous US fashion slash clothing brand, which was established over 35 years ago, which has amongst its values, the environment, human rights, and initiatives for, for women and girls. Last year, last March, it launched its Women Together initiative. 
an event series which through workshops, speaking engagements and video live streams aimed, was aimed at empowering women to find their voices and connect with one another. It was based on the belief expressed by the company founder and CEO Eileen Fisher, who you can see in the center here, that to quote her, a collective energy emerges when women connect with other women. And it started at an event where the speakers included amongst others, the American feminist icon and writer Gloria Steinem. During the pandemic, Women Connect has organized free sessions that have been hosted either weekly or twice weekly to enable women to listen to speakers on health, wellness, and to speak to one another in small breakout groups. And it very much reminds me of, of really what we're doing here today. Each session has attracted hundreds of women from across the US as well as from other English speaking countries, including the UK. And during them, the participants have expressed their gratitude at simply being able to connect with other women at a time when, again, much less like us today, they were stuck in their own homes. And one of the participants commented, for example, that she, she set her clock and got her cup of coffee ready for each of these events um, to take place and to, to participate. So what I'm proposing here, based on these two uh, examples, which of course I've dealt with very briefly, is that in the wake of the pandemic, the fashion system might take the, re the opportunity to redefine itself. Away from the leadership of large corporations intent on selling more clothes and increasing profit margins, to become the, fu the fulcrum of a new normal, in scare quotes, uh, collective consciousness, which responds to local conditions, which values caring and community as much as economic considerations under the greater leadership of women. Now, for those of us who think that this last proposition, that is the greater leadership of women, may be a little far-fetched, I'd like to finish with one final example. It hasn't passed notice that much of the most effective leadership during the pandemic has come from female, the female governance of countries such as New Zealand, Germany, Finland, Iceland, and Taiwan. A similar report to this one in Forbes in the New York Times speculated that this may be because, to quote, a female leader may be a signal that a country has more inclusive political institutions and values. And I think we can also be minded of Theresa's comments a moment ago about the leadership of the United States and other countries. The Forbes, journal, the Forbes journalist summed it up as, as follows. The story of the spread and unthinkable human tragedies of COVID-19 is the ultimate case study in high stakes leadership. I don't think any of us can afford to miss the lessons here. All leaders, including men, can learn from what we have seen women do in this crisis. So to conclude, my proposition is that in concentrating on developing a collective consciousness initiated at the local level, women in fashion as in government can play a greater role in leadership towards this new normal, which I think we're all seeking. To develop a fashion system that values humanity and care over profit, profit margins and greed. Thank you. And I should also just maybe finalize um, the, the presentation by saying this is developing some ideas I published um, last year in an issue of the journal Fashion Practice, which was um, devoted to fashion design and sustainability. So if anyone's interested in looking at this more, you can, um, you can look at that issue or I could also um, send you a copy of the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you so much for the fantastic presentation and this, you know, perspective. Uh, well, uh, Elsa says, uh, well, and our great meta. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it seems like uh, it's, yeah, just uh, one more female leader. Uh, any, any questions or comments? Yes, Patricia Califato, great message, Hazel. Uh, Elsa, yes, question, please. Um. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Hazel. It's just because I'm just uh, sitting with um, with some work about how uh, throughout the 20th century, 
you know, you all know that there's been kind of this division between the creatives of fashion, typically being women, and then the management of fashion, uh, typically being men. Uh, so I think it's very, of course, there are um, female uh, managers as well, but I think there's a shift maybe taking place. And, and some of these examples show that it also means a kind of a, a paradigmatic shift. So, um, yeah, that will be very interesting to follow what that will uh, mean. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. But I think what's also interesting about um, the two examples I shared is the potential also for fashion to be recognized as being representative of, of more than just product and more than just consumption. That, you know, that fashion can be, and yeah, okay, it's a complete redefinition of fashion, but the way that actually fashion involved the professionals, people, women, um, can, can actually be seen to be representing um, much more than the bottom, the, the bottom line, which is what, is what I like about these organizations. Of course, you know, there is a profit margin there, but there's also, you know, a much greater kind of um, collectivity being formed, which I think is really exciting. Mm. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments 